started off with seven companions, we might imagine. They got together, probably at Ephesus, and traveled together, got on a boat, went to the island of Patmos to visit John. Uh, John has lived a long time. He's maybe the last uh, disciple, direct disciple of Jesus who's still living. Uh, many people believe the book of Revelation is written very late, and so it might put John in his 80s or 90s. Most of the churches we've talked about then uh, throughout the series on Revelation are really well into their second generation, if you think of it, uh, because the people who are John's age, who were the disciples of Jesus, many of them have already gone on to be with the Lord. There are a few of them still left, and they're in that, that transition process of handing their faith to the next generation. And so these seven companions have traveled to the island. They've probably brought John some uh, provisions. Uh, my understanding is that's kind of how it worked back in, in the Roman days. If somebody was in prison or exiled, it was up to their loved ones or their community to provide for them. They, they would have had no other way. Some scholars think that John is at a, actually at a work camp, even though he's older. And he has received this vision. They show up, presumably, to give him some, some supplies and, and demonstrate some love towards him, as he had been very influential in those churches in Asia Minor. And he has something to give them in return. And so each of these messengers has received a letter. And the letter comes from this being that is described in the first chapter. It's Jesus, the one with eyes who blaze like fire. He's got a white garment, a gold sash, and he's holding in his hand seven stars that represent these seven churches. They get on the boat to leave the island and head back. Saying goodbye to John, undoubtedly for the final time. He's up there in years. They're probably not going to come back to the island to see him. And so as, the, as John kind of maybe is waving at the dock, we don't know. You know, they've said their goodbyes, and that's probably the last time this side of eternity that they are going to see who, the, the one who's probably the last living disciple of Jesus. And can you imagine the conversation on the short boat ride back to the mainland. They each have heard what the others have, uh, the letters that the others have received, the message from, the, from Jesus to their individual churches. They, they may have, while they were there visiting him, each written hand, a handwritten copy of the entire book of Revelation to take to their church. And so they've spent some considerable time together. It's been long, but I'm sure they were eager to get home, just like we would all be eager to get home if we were on a missions trip or a business trip. Stop at Ephesus for the first part of the journey. That was the first church. Probably the church had a fellowship dinner. They were probably like Leesburg. Nobody ever leaves Leesburg hungry, and maybe that was the same thing at Ephesus. And maybe they even had a Sunday service there as the, the church at Ephesus gathered. And, and maybe they all were there for their uh, elder or their angel, their messenger, to read the letter to their church. And then from Ephesus, six companions travel. Then five, then four, then three. And now we're down to the last two guys on this journey. There's only two cities remaining. And what their conversation must have been like, you know, when it just gets down to the last couple people who have had this amazing experience of spending this time with John and receiving this revelation. And they have two very different letters to two very different churches. And they come to a fork in the road, and if you turn left, you go to Philadelphia, and if you turn right, you go to Laodicea. I don't know if it worked out like this. I, I use my, I hope it's a sanctified imagination. And so they part ways right there on the road. Probably the, the, the fellow from Laodicea didn't want to spend another night waiting at Philadelphia, and he probably just wanted to get home before sunset and walk as fast as he could or, uh, or whatever he had to do to get home. I, I know when I've been away, I just want to get home. I love to be at home with my family. He probably wanted to get home with his family. But he's carrying the weight of that letter with him just as the man from Philadelphia is carrying the weight of this letter that must be read. I don't know if we'll make it to Laodicea today, but we're at least going to get started on Philadelphia. So the, the fellow from Philadelphia, they part ways. He heads back into town, 
And the very next Sunday, as they all gather, if they even waited that long, they probably did. And as soon as he came back into town, probably everybody got together. What do you have? And here's what it says. Write this letter to the angel or to the messenger of the church of Philadelphia. This is a message from the one who is holy and true. The one who has the key of David. He opens, but no one can close, and he closes but no one can open. So as Christianity began uh, emerging from Judaism, many of the meeting places were in synagogues. We know that. I mean, that is plain as day throughout the, uh, the, early, the New Testament. If you read the book of Acts, uh, it was very common for Jewish Christians to get together. Uh, they were different in their Jewish brethren because they believed that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah, the one, the promised one from the entire Old Testament, and that the, the whole Old Testament was this giant arrow pointing to this person, Jesus, who had just been crucified, risen again. He had done all these miracles. But now we're, we're a few years removed. I mean, think about that. We're 50 years maybe removed or 40 years. It's been a while. And so the message of Jesus is still going out, but now there's, there's, big, there's been enough time go by that some people in the synagogue don't want to hear any more about this Jesus stuff and being the Messiah. Can you imagine the divide if we, if we came into church this morning and, and this half the church believed that Jesus is God and this half didn't? That'd be pretty significant. That'd be hard. I've, I've heard churches split over much frivolous, more frivolous things like the color of the carpet or which side the organ or the piano should be on. So what happened is that people's names could be removed from the rolls in the synagogue. Your name could be blotted out. Have you heard that language in this text anywhere as we've read through these letters about names being blotted out? That was a, a very uh, present reality to these people that their name could be taken off the registry of the synagogue and literally the door to the synagogue could be shut in their face. You don't belong here. You're not a true Jewish person because... You believe in this Jesus, and, you, and, you, and for the Jewish people, it was, you're rejecting Moses, you're rejecting all of the old, and they weren't, but there was a, a misunderstanding between them, and the door of the synagogue was slammed shut in their face. The danger in your name being taken off the registry was that in, in the ancient Roman world, you had to say that Caesar was God at certain occasions, and the, the Jewish people had an exception clause to that to just kind of keep the peace. The Roman uh, officials had allowed the Jews to have an exception. They didn't have to say that Caesar was God because they knew the Jewish people believed in only one God. They were monotheist. Well, if your name was taken off the registry, you couldn't claim the exemption anymore. So it was a big problem if your name had been blotted out, if the door was shut in your face. And so now if your name is no longer on the registry and those occasions come by, you don't have the exemption and you either have to decide, do I say Caesar is God or do I say there's only one God and that, that's the God in heaven and that's the one I serve and then face whatever consequences might come after that. And we know from some of the other churches that in some of these locations the consequences were pretty severe. So it's interesting that he opens this, this dialogue with, there's the one who opens what no one can close and closes what no one can open. I know the things you do, verse 8, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. Nobody's ever going to slam this door in your face. I have kicked a door open. Nobody can close it. And, and think about the influence of Christianity from that first and second generation. By comparison, the synagogue would diminish. Nobody would even hear about it or think about it. But look at how the Christian church exploded. And Christ had, had kicked a door open for them. And the gospel was going all around the world. And often it was going because of persecution. The people were fleeing persecution. And they would go to the next town. And people would be confer converted to Christ. And, and then they would go to the next town. And people would be converted to Christianity. And so Christianity spread like wildfire. And it wasn't based upon any kind of nationality like Judaism was. So it had the opportunity to grow and flourish in the Gentile world. And Jesus is saying to these believers, I'm putting a door that's open in front of you. Nobody can close it. Where else have you heard the term, the door being opened or closed by God? 
Does anybody remember an Old Testament story where God closed a door? It's the door of the ark. Remember that? He closed a door. Could anybody open that door? It doesn't say Noah closed. It says God shut the door. God had made a way for salvation. And when the time came, that door was closed. And those left on the outside had to face judgment. He says, I know the things you do, and I've set before you. I've opened a door for you that no one can close. And then look at what he says. You have little strength. He doesn't brag on how great they are. It's not like the church we talked about last week that had this great reputation, and and everybody thought they were awesome. If you looked at this congregation, you might not think that they were very strong. By 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 the estimation of Jesus, you're not really that strong, he says. You have a little strength. But you have obeyed my word. The word of God was important to you and you were obedient to it. And you did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue. That's that's a rough language. See, they think that they're my chosen people, but, but here they've rejected Messiah. I will I will force those, those liars who say they are Jews or not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones that I love. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. When persecution, when difficulties come, there's this kind of separation. There's a time of testing. I believe there's a time of testing coming for us as well. And he says, because you've obeyed me, I'm going to protect you in that great test. And he says, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God. They will never have to leave. I will write them Uh, I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven, from my God. And I will write on them my new name. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. And can you imagine if you were sitting there that Sunday at the church at Philadelphia, and you don't see yourself as a strong church. You don't really think of yourself like the, the church at Sardis or others that, or Ephesus that had these big reputations. And you just think, we're, we're small, we're weak, we're nothing. And then the encouragement. Because they, I, I would presume that as they read the letters, they had heard what the Spirit said to all these other churches. And can you imagine if I walked in this morning and I said, I've got a letters for all of the churches in our presbytery. And, uh, and each one is mentioned, and you had to listen, you know, to each one, and let's find out how Jason Shep's doing, you know, and let's find out, you know, and, and then you, you'd be worried, like, oh, what's it going to say to us? Because, see, there were some churches that thought they were great that, that kind of got smacked down a little bit. And then there were these other two, two, two churches there's nothing negative said about. They were the ones who seemed weak, right? The ones who were being persecuted, And it had to be just an enormous encouragement to them to say, hey, we're on the right track. We're doing the right thing. We love God's word and we're not going to deny him. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying, not just to this church, but to the church S. There's a message here. Not just for Philadelphia or Sardis or Ephesus. There's a message here for Leesburg. Christ is intimately aware of each congregation, each local church. I think that's something we take from this text. He cares about each local church. He knows each local church. He knows their deeds. He knows. And when Christ looks down from heaven and he sees what happens here. He sees people washing dishes. He sees pie auctions. He sees veterans dinners, vacation Bible school. Christ sees it all. But he sees the the stuff that we can't see. He also sees on the inside. He sees our heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And and he knows the heart. And and he knows if we love his word and if if we're welcoming God's word into our life or if we're not. This is a profound encouragement that he gives to this church. But there's one more guy. 
that fork in the road happened. And he's on his way to Laodicea. I don't know if you've read ahead or not. Some of you are, you know, you like to read ahead. Some of you already know. And you've read ahead and you're like, ooh, it gets rough. You'll have to come back next week to find out what happens in Laodicea. <laughs> and I think it's going to be fitting. There's a very famous verse that gets written to the church at Laodicea. I'll give you a little window. Because next week we're going to do communion. And there's this little verse that says, Behold, I stand, have you heard that one? At the door and... If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and we'll have a meal together. Next week, you're going to have that same opportunity as the people at Laodicea had. I think you're going to find some very interesting things. I look at the fact that today we, we hear a church that has doors that no man can open, that are shut that nobody can open, that are open that nobody can shut. But then next week, we have Jesus saying, I'd like somebody on the inside to open this for me. I mean, he can open doors nobody can shut, and he can shut doors that nobody can open, and yet he says to that church next week, I need somebody on the inside. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement we receive from it. Lord, there are many here who are faithful to you, and you've been faithful to us. You've loved us, called us to yourself. You've given us many opportunities to serve in this community, some around the world. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us and strengthen us like you did the church at Philadelphia. Lord, encourage us that our labor is not in vain in the Lord and that you are seeing the, the good that is being done. You see our heart. Lord, Lord, I pray that this church would be like the church at Philadelphia and that we would love your word that we would obey it, and that even if times get tough, we will never deny you. Lord, your disciples made that claim that they wouldn't deny you, and then before the rooster crowed, Peter had denied you three times. So Lord, help it to be more than words. When we're faced with the opportunities, whether it's at work or with family at Thanksgiving, Lord, help us to be bold in our witness to love your word and not deny you, that we may share in the benefits of having you place the victor's crown on our head. You're the one who gives us the strength to run this race and the strength to win it. So all glory goes to you in Jesus' name. Amen.